to Real Talk, the show where we look at issues facing our youth. My name is Ome Kongo, I'm your host, and across the country we're talking about issues of education, whether it's in Wisconsin, whether it's teachers in Rhode Island getting pink slips or potential pink slips, everyone is talking about how we can improve education today. Well, I wanted to spend some time today talking about education right here in Montgomery County. So I have a teacher with us who has been in the county for a couple of years, but has been teaching all across the country and has a great deal of knowledge that she's going to impart for us today. Sandy Young is a native of Louisiana. She graduated from LSU with degrees in English and broadcast journalism and a minor in history. Certified to teach secondary social studies and English in the state of Maryland. She taught high school for three years in Louisiana, 13 years in Texas, and in Montgomery County since 2008. She's also taught middle school for six years while in Texas, 19 years total experience teaching high school English, U.S. history, and Texas history. She also loves students, so she's always involved in every type of extracurricular activity that she can find herself to be involved in. She's also taught government and economics. She served as a varsity cheerleader coach in Texas, worked in Montgomery County as a literacy coach and an academic intervention teacher, currently teaching honors, on-level, and AP U.S. history at Watkins Mill High School. Sandy, welcome to Real Talk. Thank you. How, are, how are you doing? I'm good. Excellent. I want to get right to it because you have a wealth of experience, as everybody can hear, and there's just several questions I wanted to ask you just to get your perspective and just share some information with the people out there. Yeah. So the first thing I wanted to ask, based on your experiences, not only in school but going to meetings and trainings across the country, what sense do you get as a state of education in Montgomery County? Are we in crisis mode? Are we doing okay? What, what do you see? I think Montgomery County is ahead of the curve. In a lot of ways, uh, they're definitely not in crisis mode when you're talking about educating students. Now, mm -hmm. when you start talking about financial and those types of uncertainties, that's something different. But I think what I see in Montgomery County is that they, they tend to look at trends and, and set trends in a lot of ways. A lot of other school districts look to Montgomery County to see what we're doing mm -hmm. and to pattern mm -hmm. themselves after that because we do have a lot of success in areas that other schools with the same populations and the same changes in populations don't really see. Mm -hmm. But I do think we're doing well there are anywhere, the things you could improve, but we're doing better than the average school district because you hear about this crisis in education mm -hmm. and you know kids who aren't getting this and aren't getting that and teachers who aren't doing this and I, I don't see that in mm -hmm. Montgomery County. Well, but at the same time, we do see, however, that there are cutbacks that are taking place here yes. as well as everywhere else and things like staff development training, other professional development opportunities. Do you feel like that has had an effect in the classroom as it relates to student achievement? I think it does for younger teachers. Mm -hmm. With, you know, I've, Like you said, I've been teaching for 19 years. Mm -hmm. I think our younger teachers, those cuts have hurt them because there's a lot of support that could come from a staff development teacher, that mm -hmm. could come from trainings that they're not getting because of budget constraints yes, and the yes. only thing that can take the place of that um, would be older teachers mentoring those younger teachers and mm -hmm. we do have mentoring programs and you know it's not the same as because a lot of times you'll tell a young teacher well you should do it a different way but then there you need to show them you need to tell them mm -hmm. what's mm -hmm. another way give me an idea don't tell me fix something Tell me how it should fix it. And I think that's something we're missing with the budget cutbacks. And also just with teachers doing so much more now, as yeah. it relates to cutbacks, they have to do more with less. Do you feel like those opportunities for mentoring are, are really there, even though they're, it kind of exists, it but it's really happening? It can't be as intense. Mm -hmm. it can't, you can't spend as much time with young teachers. I'm very fortunate why, where I am. You have a lot of, in the department I'm in, there's a mm -hmm. lot of that that goes on. And at the school I'm at, we do a lot. We do you know, professional learning communities, and that helps a great deal with younger teachers. We share uh, ideas for lessons, and, you know, we're very collaborative. Mm -hmm. And I think when you foster that kind of environment, you can get those things done. It's going to require more from us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some teachers are at the point where, like, I do enough. I'm not doing anything else. And I, I totally see that. Yeah. But we, we do tend to try to find a way in most cases to help these younger teachers out because we were all there. Yes, we were yeah, all that right, first right, year right. teacher who had no clue with all of the acronyms meant and all of no, you know uh, all of that mm -hmm. stuff. So, no, do you see as having been in the county since 2008, do you see that there are issues as it relates to the students? Do you feel like with the cuts and everything that have taken place, students haven't missed a beat or do, or do you feel like they're, they're lacking as it relates to what they're getting in the classroom? I think anytime you increase class size, which is what has had to occur in recent years, mm -hmm. 
students lose out a little bit because a lot of times people will say, well, what's wrong with education? Why can't we do this? Why can't we do that? It's student to teacher ratio. If yeah. all of my classes ideally were 15 kids, yes, they'd all so. be, you know, getting all of the one-on-one -on -one attention I could give them. Mm -hmm. If, But mm -hmm. when you double that class size, it, it's, you know, simple math. They're not right, going right. to get as much attention. So I think that has kind of hurt kids a little bit. Um, I don't know how significantly, but I think it, it's definitely a factor. Mm -hmm. It's definitely going to be a factor yes, later yes. on. When kids have, when you have more kids in a classroom and a teacher has more responsibility, as far as you know, getting those kids to where they need to be. Now, staying on on, on just keeping a, you know team focus and youth focus in general, we see across the country, and people have said this has happened in Montgomery County, particularly with the educational standards that were set under No Child Left Behind under the last presidential administration. People are talking so much about now we don't have time to do anything. We just have to teach to the test. We can't focus on arts. We can't focus on music. Everything is teaching to the test. Do you feel like that's something that you're seeing in this county? And, and how are students reacting to that? I think where I am uh, and what I teach, which is U.S. history, it's not as specific. I think here in Montgomery County, our tests are very, very specific mm -hmm. for high school. You have a biology test. You have an algebra test. You have a government test. Mm -hmm. And you have an English 10 test those teachers might feel more like they're teaching to the test because they are going to be graded by yes. that. Since I teach a different subject, I feel a lot freer to teach my subject mm -hmm. and to, yeah, I have to follow curriculum and standards and all of those things, right. but I don't feel like I'm going to be graded harshly by the end of the year by a test. Yeah. Um, I do think you lose something with all of the emphasis on testing. Um, I think it's gone at one point, we were completely, there were no standards, there was no measurement, and now we've gone completely in the other direction with No Child Left Behind. I think mm -hmm. it's taken testing to an extreme level to where I think it's detrimental to kids, especially younger kids. Mm -hmm. They have anxiety about those yeah. tests. You know, I, I remember seeing a kid on television who just burst into tears wow. when I lived in Texas when they asked him, how, are you, how do you feel about the tax test, which is their version of HSA? Mm -hmm. And the child just started to bawl because he had been told this wow. is so, such an important test. Mm -hmm. So I think we've gone all the way in the other direction when there has to be some medium. But do we really have time to, to, to find that medium now? I think Sometimes I feel like we don't, based on what I'm seeing. You know, in the short term, no. Mm -hmm. In the long mm -hmm. term, we have to. Because I believe the problem that's always existed in education has been there's a short-sightedness. Mm -hmm. That we, we mm -hmm. need to come up with a quick fix, and we can't wait. Mm -hmm. And I understand the urgency of things, but I think we need to work on fixing it now because mm -hmm. no matter how long it takes because in the long run you, you have to plan for the long term I mean we yes. all plan for retirement we don't plan mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. our 40s mm -hmm. <laughs> unless right, we're right, right. very wealthy and intend to retire soon mm -hmm. yeah now, that makes a lot of sense now when you're looking at, at students as, as it relates to overall achievement where we say you know right now because we're focusing on, on the short-term goals we still see that we have students who are lagging behind whether they're different backgrounds racially economically what do you see as some of the challenges that our, our students are facing from di different backgrounds are the ELL population suffering more with some of the budget changes and, and the resource shifts or is it a class thing what, what are you seeing in the classroom um, I think what's true now has always been true regardless of the budget cuts. Mm -hmm. Kids who come from, it's the, the socioeconomic factor is mm -hmm. so much bigger than race, than gender, than language. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It affects how much a kid is exposed to at home, how much prior knowledge they come to school with. Mm -hmm. um, I know when I taught in Texas, all of the kids who were in the gifted program came from middle, upper middle class homes. And that was the Asian kids, the black kids, the Hispanic kids. Mm -hmm. Those kids made up the gifted classes because they had that exposure. They had learned things that other kids didn't. And I think that socioeconomic piece is what holds some kids back. Mm -hmm. Now, funding for special education has pretty much remained kind of constant. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think the special education population suffers from the funding cuts. Mm -hmm. The ESOL kids, the ELL kids, that may they may be hurt by mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's significant enough to see a big difference at this point. Who mm -hmm. knows what will happen? But I think across the board, kids in general, when you 
up those class sizes. Mm -hmm. That's where you see the problem. But isn't it true that there's a disproportionality as it relates to the overall representation in the special education of African American and, and Latino students? You don't feel like some of that could be to possibly having educators in the county who may not have the ability to reach students who come from different backgrounds, or do you really think it's about the students not coming prepared? I think that could be a factor. Mm -hmm. I definitely think that, uh, you know, that it's, you have to be able to relate to kids to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that when, a, you know, the bottom line, when a kid comes from a family where they're not being read to, where you have kids who have to work, um, kids who really don't have time to read Chapter 10 mm -hmm. because they're helping mm -hmm. their parents out mm -hmm. to make a living. I think that's where you see kids start to fall behind. And mm -hmm. we've, I've seen studies that for the most part, up until third grade, all things being the same, you know, born in, born in this country, speak English as your first language, those kids are on the same page with the reading level. It's at mm -hmm. third grade the separation starts to occur. Nobody can seem to pinpoint what happens, whether mm -hmm. it's the the material, the instruction, the work gets harder, but for some reason that's where you start to see that achievement gap mm -hmm. show itself. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm at a loss to explain where it comes from, but I, I have noticed that with that socioeconomic thing, kids who, who are coming from homes where they don't have access to something beyond television, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they tend to fall behind. Now, this kind of gives me it just makes me think about something that you said before we even got here today, because when you said that third grade reading scores, in our, in our pre-conversation, you said that we're actually in this country building prisons based off of third grade reading scores. Yes. And, one of the, and, and you're their education expert here, but one thing I also read was that our suspension, not just Montgomery County, but just generally, the numbers of Latinos and black students in special ed, the suspensions, it kind of tracks along the prison line. So the quite, you know, people who are not spending time in school getting suspended, they're ending up involved in the legal system, yeah. in the penal system in some way, shape, or form. So the, the question that I have is, are these lack of resources and opportunities le leaving our kids, causing our kids to leave one institution and basically get involved in another? That's a tough question. Mm -hmm. um, I do think you, you can go to any prison mm -hmm. and you will see dropouts mm -hmm. and you will see people who are functionally illiterate. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes from not having those opportunities. Montgomery County has done a pretty decent job of trying to address its changing diversity because it's gone. You know, you have a huge ELL population mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm in Texas. It, Esau meant you spoke Spanish. In Montgomery <laughs> County, you speak Tagalog. Uh -huh. and there's, you know, you speak French and all. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's amazing. The diversity is, I, I think it's wonderful. But it's harder for teachers to bridge that gap culturally because mm -hmm. these kids, it isn't just a generation thing. You know, we're already looked at as dinosaurs. <laughs> but it's also, it's a cultural thing. You have kids, you know, I remember I had a student who wouldn't look at me and she wouldn't meet my eyes. And mm -hmm. it was in, because in her culture that was seen as disrespectful. So those are things that we might need to be educated about. Mm -hmm. But I do think that it's, it's like I've always said, you either pay to educate children now or pay to jail them later. Mm -hmm. and, and for some kids, unfortunately, there is an overrepresentation nationwide of African American males and Latino males who are being suspended and who are in uh, special education. Mm -hmm. And sometimes kids are put in special education. I don't necessarily know if it's a learning disability mm -hmm. or it's just not having gotten the basics right, right. all along. And, it, you know, I have a niece who is dyslexic, mm -hmm. she, that she has a learning disability. She, it's not that she hasn't gotten the basics. Some kids just, you know, they're in and out of school all the time. Mm -hmm. They're transient. They, they don't, they switch three schools in a year and there's no chance to get settled. Yeah, and I want to talk about that. We're, we're going to head to a break right now, but you talked about some of the things that, were, that are happening in Montgomery County to reach these students and help everyone get to that next level. Definitely want to hear more about that as we come back from the break. And we'll be right back with Real Talk. My name's Reggie. Just recently, my wife and I took in her sister's children. And we already had four, so I went from becoming a family man to a man with a bigger family. <clears throat> now, you can't eat love, so... I don't know how I'm going to feed them tonight. How was that, Rich? I think I look more like Denzel. 
That's cold, man. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. Welcome back to Real Talk, the show where we look at issues facing our youth. We're talking with Sandy Young, an educator here in Montgomery County and has spent time in Louisiana and Texas, hasn't taught in my hometown of Massachusetts, no. but <laughs> I won't hold that against you. And before we went to the break, we were talking about some of the strategies and techniques that people were using in Montgomery County to help students achieve. And one of the ones that I kind of wanted to get your opinion on was the whole concept of the bridge projects that came out over the last couple of years. They came out with much controversy, and some people were saying we were dumbing down the way that the ways that we we're giving kids opportunities to graduate. Other people were saying it's great because it's giving students who may not succeed on the test an option to still graduate and do something they may love. What are your thoughts about the bridge project? couple of years down the line? Um, the first year I worked on Bridge, I thought, I thought it was um, just a, a stopgap measure by the state of Maryland because mm -hmm. I was coming from Texas where we have a test where you have to pass this test to graduate. And in mm -hmm. Texas, if you didn't pass the test, you didn't graduate. There mm -hmm. was no alternative path to graduation. Right. Right. But what I've seen with the Bridge projects is that in a lot of instances, especially with our ESOL kids and some of our special education kids, that once they've done a project, because we, the thing we, we did and what people may not have understood at first was that the kids still kept testing. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. still would take the test even though they were, we, we called it them being on the dual path. Uh -huh. So it, doing the projects actually got them prepared for the test. The test, the projects were not, I think the first year they were kind of experimenting and they were mm -hmm. not that difficult. They've, been, they've got more difficult, they've got more detailed, and they address the skills that they need to pass the HSA. So it's gotten, I think it works to a certain extent because it serves as remediation for the mm -hmm. test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in some instances, I can see why people would say, you know, it's just it's just a cop out. Don't want to hurt our graduation rates. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the truth be told, a lot of kids don't do well on standardized tests. And it wasn't like we did the projects and they were approved and everybody said, oh, they're great. Mm -hmm. Projects were rejected. Students had to do projects over, you know. So it it was a process. And I think for the most part, it's been pretty successful. And we've had some kids who, even when they do the project, they still want to pass. They still want to take the test, mm -hmm. and they still want to pass the test. They want that passing score on the test. So that that's been a positive thing. But you haven't found that there are maybe people who would succeed in a test, but feel like just doing the bridge project would, would be easier, and just kind of looking at that a, a, as I, an option. I thought that would happen at first, but mm -hmm. what I've seen at my school, and I mm -hmm. can't speak for the rest of the county, is the kids who have to do the project. They mm -hmm. tell all of their friends, "You don't want to do this. Really? You really don't want to do this because mm -hmm. this takes hours, mm -hmm. and it really does. You know, we can do one NSL project that will take five Saturdays of Saturday school, mm -hmm. or you know." five weeks of regular school, you know, and they don't want to give up that time. They don't want to give up that Saturday. Because the thing with the Bridge Project is it has to be taught either at Saturday school as part of the High School Plus program or mm -hmm. during the school day. Mm -hmm. So there's funding that goes along with that, and there's sacrifice made by the kids, and they don't necessarily want to give up that time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of kids have said, I wish I had done better on the test, and I didn't have to do this project. Interesting. Now, for other teachers who are out here watching from the different schools, what are some of the other strategies and techniques that you all are doing at your school during the school year to help students achieve? You mentioned Saturday school. What, what other types of programs are, are you all We do have in? Saturday school. We mm -hmm. have um, an outreach for our Latino students at mm -hmm. our school. We have some, a, a person at school who's in charge of doing that. Mm -hmm. um, we definitely do. We always do the back-to-school night thing, uh -huh. but teachers at my school tend to contact parents a lot. We try to get parents involved as much as possible. It's not always successful. Um, it's not always a positive outcome. You know, mm -hmm. I try to call home not just for bad stuff, but, <laughs> but when kids are doing well or when they've improved or just to send an email. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot, we have a step. Our lunch period is called step and, mm -hmm. step and it's 45 minutes long. And that's all, it's that long because teachers and students have the opportunity to work together. Mm -hmm. Students can come in for extra help. They can come in to make up work, um, whatever it is they need to do. We also have something called village time where mm -hmm. every Tuesday and Thursday there's an extra 37 minutes added to 
first period than mm -hmm. second period. Mm -hmm. Kids get to make up work, they get tutoring, anything they need for that class, or they can go and see another teacher. Mm -hmm. And that's helped kids raise their grades okay. in, in a lot of instances. So it sounds like there are a lot of ends. If you could talk about Saturday school, which you said, which is great, people can talk about after school programs, but it seems over at, at, at Watkins that there are a lot of in school yes. opportunities for our students to, to make up work, get involved in tests. Now, some people may say, well, I can have a, a step period or something, but the kids are just, uh, they're not going to come, so why even bother? Are you finding that participation from the students is great uh, throughout the different activities in general? I think it's, um, it's hit or miss. I mean, sometimes, uh -huh, uh -huh. sometimes you, you know, have tons of kids coming to see you, and there are some mm -hmm. teachers who don't seem to eat lunch because they are with kids the entire step period. Mm -hmm. Our English mm -hmm. teachers in particular, especially the um, IB teachers, they yes. spend a lot of time at their lunch period with kids. And for the most part, teachers don't mind doing it. They don't mind working with kids at step. Mm -hmm. um, because that's also an out for teach, not you know, because you don't have to stay so late after school. Mm -hmm. You know, and kids mm -hmm. have after school activities they're right, involved right, in, right, so right. that helps us out tremendously. And participation for the motivated kids it's there. Sometimes mm -hmm. you have to motivate them. You yeah, have to. Yeah, yeah. You you have to. You have to make an appointment. You need to come and see me because mm -hmm. the kids may not initiate it. Sometimes the teacher has to say, "You need to come and see me tomorrow to do this, this, or this." That's, no, that's interesting. Now, this the name of the show is Real Talk, so uh -huh. I, I, have, I have real talk <laughs> about this, but one particular issue. You've been in Louisiana. You've been in Texas. I know you've seen the best and worst. What, what are some of the things that you've been involved in in Louisiana or Texas that you really feel could benefit the, the county here that maybe the county is not even interested in, in, in trying or doesn't even know about? Well, what, what could help from your experiences could, to improve the county? Um, I think one of the things that we did in Texas that we did well mm -hmm. that focused on attendance, because attendance is an issue. You know, it's very mm -hmm. contentious. Montgomery County recently got rid of the loss of credit policy, which doesn't seem, you know, a lot of teachers have complained that kids are tardy, they're not mm -hmm. coming to school because they won't lose credit. In Texas, we, um, in my school district, if a student had three, unex less than three unexcused absences mm -hmm. and an average of 80 in a class, they could exempt their final exam. Wow. That kept a lot of students, you know, on a day where they might think, oh, I think I'm going to come to school today. Mm -hmm. It's raining mm -hmm. or here it's snowing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And they were like, I don't want to lose my exemption. I want to make a B in that, at least a B, and I don't want to, I want to be able to come to school. Mm -hmm. I also think the way we do our eligibility may need to change. Mm -hmm. um, I totally understand that a kid should be ineligible if they're failing classes, but I think when the interims come out, if they are passing all of their classes, that they should regain their eligibility. And I know that's a state thing, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I think statewide that's how it was done. If you were failing at six weeks, we didn't have quarters, and you brought your GPA up by in the next three weeks, you were eligible again. And I oh, think that gives a lot of motivation, mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of kids, they go, oh, I'm ineligible at the end of the quarter. It's going to be another nine weeks. I'm done. Right. right so a right. lot of them will quit on you right then and there. Like, I'm done. I can't play soccer. I can't play football, whatever. I'm done. Mm. That's, in that's interesting. I hope everyone's listening is really thinking <laughs> about that, especially the attendance itself, yeah. because that, that's a big issue. I mean, you have kids who aren't coming or only coming for certain classes and not engaged. Yeah, and if you tell me if I only miss three, if I miss less than three days and I have mm -hmm. a B, I don't have to take the 100-question U.S. history final, mm -hmm. I'm going to try my best not to miss the days and, yeah, and to yeah. be exempt from that final. Mm -hmm. And it worked. It really, you'd be surprised at how many kids bought into that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at some places, it was some school districts, you just were passing. Yeah, you didn't have yeah, to take yeah, the exam. Yeah. But I think there needs to be, you know, a higher standard. What do you think about what's going on across the country before everything we're seeing in education in, in Wisconsin and, and everywhere else? Are teachers just whiners? Uh, you know, I, I, is, it, it, are our unions really the problem? Are we waiting for a Superman <laughs> or Wonder Woman? Or, you know? I've taught without a union um, in Texas. It's a right-to-work state, mm -hmm. so the union really has no voice. And I much prefer teaching here in Maryland where mm -hmm. I, I do feel like the union speaks for me. I feel like I have at least some support, some negotiating tool. Mm -hmm. In Texas, I feel like just edicts were, were being handed down from on high, and this is what you were going to do, and mm -hmm. you don't get to say anything about it. Yeah. And I, think, I don't think teachers are whiners at all. I think whenever we talk about, oh, what are the problems in education, 
everybody blames teachers. Are there bad teachers? I'm sure there are. Are there bad police officers, bad doctors? Yeah. And I think the idea that all we do is sweep out all the bad teachers and everything will be perfect is very disingenuous because mm -hmm. that's, that's not going to solve everything. That's not going to solve it. I think teachers are being, you know, they were talking about the Wisconsin teachers and all. The average salary in Wisconsin is $51,000 a year. Mm -hmm. They're not living high off the hog, <laughs> even for Wisconsin. Right, you know, we're right, sure right, the cost right, of living right. is not like D.C. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, that, that's very interesting. So what do you say to people who aren't involved in education who say, what are teachers complaining about? They're in school from, you know, 8 to 3 or whatever. Oh. They have the summers off. Why don't they just take it and shut you know, up? You uh, one of my students asked me the other day about, we were talking about unions. Mm -hmm. so we were talking about the 1940s and 50s. And how they, you know, got minimum wages and all of this stuff and overtime. And mm -hmm. he said, well, will you, what do you get when you work overtime? I said, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> uh -huh. I said, uh -huh. I'm paid for eight hours a day. You mm -hmm. know, and if I stay in the building until 6 o'clock at night, that's my choice. Mm -hmm. You know, when mm -hmm. I take papers home, when I stay after for, even if I'm being paid a stipend for an extracurricular activity, mm -hmm it doesn't cover the hours you spend with kids because it, it just it just really doesn't mm -hmm. so to say oh you work 10 months a year yeah we do but we work we work more than 40 hours a week mm -hmm. so you can just spread that out and I really think it should be a requirement for every parent who has a child in public school to substitute teach one day Ooh. I really do slow down <laughs> <laughs> come in, come in and real. substitute teach mm -hmm. and you know and see if you still feel like we're just you know sitting down and that doesn't even take into account planning and creating things to try Grading. to make, yeah to try and you know Montgomery County has been wonderful it has great technology and teachers spend a lot of time it's not like we just have these things in our room and we don't use them these mm -hmm. wonderful mm -hmm. Promethean boards that are just like if I'd had this when I was a kid I'd never miss school all we yeah, had a chalkboard yeah. <laughs> right, you know right, and right. it's like, oh, we go out of our way to, to plan and to make things as interesting as possible mm -hmm. and to keep kids engaged and to keep them involved and to, you just can't, if they had to pay us overtime, like, you know, time and a half and yeah, double yeah, time, yeah, yeah. they wouldn't be able to afford it. Mm. So I think people from the outside looking in, it may seem like, oh, you got this, you got that. You, you really got to do the job. I mean, mm. you have to love the job, but anybody, even if you love your job, doesn't, make, doesn't mean it's easy. doesn't right, mean it's a, right, a walk right. in the park. So you've been here since 2008, been across the country doing this work. You optimistic about education here in Montgomery County? Um, I am. I think um, what I have always appreciated about Montgomery County is that they, they tend to t trust teachers. Mm -hmm. um, we're not babysat. In Texas, I always felt like I was being babysat. I mm -hmm. always felt like I was being, Big Brother was watching. And uh -huh. it's not that Montgomery County is lackadaisical or laissez-faire, mm -hmm. they tend to trust us as professionals mm -hmm. and as mm -hmm. adults. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that, you know, that they feel like they've hired good people and I'm going to trust them to do their job. And, you know, we're monitored and we're observed and all of those things happen. But I just feel like I have more of a voice and I have more of a say than I ever have in, in my previous educational experiences. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, you, you said a lot here, so it's been a mouthful. I think that not only educators, but people outside of education will also be very interested in, in hearing what you have to say. And I hope so. And anyone who has any feedback from me can just get in contact with you at Montgomery County Schools, mcpsmd.org. Yep, that's it. And reach out to you, Miss, Miss Sandy Young. And I, they can come and sub for me, too. <laughs> <laughs> whenever, um, they, whenever they want to come in and try it out, I'd be more than happy to let them sub for me. Well, thank you very much for, for, for coming and sharing with us. Thank you for inviting me. And that's going to do it for us today here at, at Real Talk. Once again, my name is Ome Kongo. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email me at realtalk at omekongo.com. And remember, our youth are 50% of the population now, but they're 100% of our future. So let's always make sure we're investing in them. See you next time.